Thank you um, so much for having me, Jim, and to uh, Giovanna and Rich. Uh, also, thank you to all of you that are attending um, today. Uh, I dearly wish I could talk about my Cambridge research and present data, but like, uh, well, you know, it is unfortunate, but we're not able to travel. So uh, I will be talking about my PhD. Um, just quickly also to mention that my supervisors were Dr. George Adamson and Professor Elan Kelman. And my research examined uh, the memory of tropical cyclones in Mauritius and how this memory is constructed, how it's deployed, and particularly how it's influenced responses uh, across history. So uh, before we start, I want to just briefly talk about which disciplines I come from and uh, my background. And this is kind of obligatory in a talk, um, but I think the various hats we wear uh, dictate what we study and how we study it. And the point of this cartoon is to say uh, that I'm not a historian by training. And before my PhD, I was very much the man about to be ambushed um, by the complexity of uh, doing, doing history. And my background is in human geography and social science of disasters. So I did a BSc in disaster management at Coventry, and I followed that with an MSc uh, in climate change and international development at UEA. And I also worked um, on several international research projects that looked at how different groups are vulnerable or resilient to disasters uh, as a result of their culture and their knowledge. So I kind of had a little bit of a historical insight, but mainly through the indigenous knowledge and geomythology angle. Um, I'd certainly never set foot in an archive before, and a lot of this research um, was based on archive work, which uh, I'm going to come back to. Okay, so I am going to talk for 45 minutes, I hope. Actually, I'll just start my timer. Um, so this is sort of divided into two parts. The first three parts are various introductions and background. Firstly, to the theory, the theoretical background, but then to specifically Mauritius and tropical cyclones. And then I'm going to detail uh, the methods I used. So I'm going to have to pass over quite a lot of stuff here fairly quickly. Um, because I want to cover a lot of results. So if you have questions about these parts, um, do please ask a question about them. The meat of the, the talk, so to say, is split into three sections. Um, quite conveniently for me, these are roughly papers that I'm either trying to get out or have got out of this data set. Um, so first I'm going to talk about the cyclone chronology that I produce, but also the data that exists and how memory works in archives. And then I'm going to present three examples of cycles in memory and cycles in responses to cyclones over time. It's a bit of a mouthful. And then uh, thirdly, I'm going to do a sort of deep dive into one specific uh, historical case study to talk about institutional trajectories of vulnerability. OK, so to start with some theoretical background, um, this probably isn't necessary for this audience, but we all know that disasters are a product of uh, long-term social and cultural processes of vulnerability and hazards, and that these things act out on long timescales. So to understand vulnerability, we need to understand history in the long term. There is a, still a debate going on about how exactly we should use history to inform our understanding of disasters and uh, if past events can be used as analogues. But um, despite this, there is agreement that by examining disasters in the past, uh, we can identify long-term social and cultural processes or recurrent structures and practices involved in disasters. So basically, even if history doesn't repeat itself, we can still find structural knowledge behind disasters and uh, find out how disasters might act as triggers or even reveal pre-existing conditions of vulnerability today. And uh, Georgina Enfield, among many others, uh, have, have showed the importance of viewing disasters in their historical context, particularly if they are repetitive in nature, like tropical cyclones. Because the impact of one disaster and the ability to recover very strongly depends on the historical context and the sequence of events, not just the, the last event, but the entire historical progression. And uh, to some people, this long-term perspective is called a long durée approach. Uh, it basically just means focusing on historical structures 
and combining elements of event and process in an effort to uncover some of the slowly changing relationships between people, between the environment and between culture. Um, another thing that a longer term approach can offer is an insight into what normal means. Um, normal in terms of weather, in terms of cyclones, and to different groups uh, and how this meaning has changed over time. And uh, obviously this has uh, clear implications for climate change. But I think um, it's fair to say that the historical context is often ignored or misunderstood in disaster policies and to a lesser extent in disaster research. And uh, the tricky part, as I see it, is uh, connecting history to current contexts. So my research um, brought together historical and contemporary data to try and understand community vulnerability, but also to understand this over time, as well as the role of time uh, as a uh, unit of examination in its own right. So that's just a quick um, theoretical background. In terms of uh, a practical background of Mauritius, um, this is what Mauritius looks like on a good day when there isn't a cyclone. It's in the Indian Ocean, uh, located close to Reunion, and it has a really fascinating history. Um, it was occupied by the Dutch in the 1600s and uh, then the French in the 1700s before the British. And then it finally gained independence in 1968. Uh, this is what Mauritius looks like after a cyclone. Um, these amazing photos, these incredible photos, were taken after a particularly bad one called Carol in 1960. And uh, tropical cyclones have devastated the island a number of times across its history, but the history of cyclones itself is underexplored. I'll come to the, the various records that exist uh, a little bit later on, but what we particularly don't know is the history of responses and the history of experiences of tropical cyclones. And uh, it hasn't really been approached in a systematic way before. The reason this is important is because the vulnerability of Mauritius, like many places, is a bit of an unknown. There's a lot of confidence statements made about uh, the warning system, about forecasting, but the levels of awareness in Mauritius are uh, now uncertain, and it's not clear how people react to the next big one. And I think it's important to, to state that there will be a next big one. And uh, the reason we can be confident about that is because of climate change. Um, projections and models agree that there's likely to be an increase in intensity of tropical cyclones, but a decrease in frequency. And uh, recent models have shown that the passage of cyclones is likely to slow. So tropical cyclones, particularly intense ones, are likely to sit over the island for longer and uh, thus cause more damage. So that's really a quick introduction to Mauritius, but also to the tropical cyclone story there. Um, I'm going to cover the methods now. Uh, I did three in my PhD. The first was archive work. So I was searching in the archives in Mauritius for descriptive qualitative material regarding cyclones, um, regarding their experiences, but also the response and recovery. So this particularly included gathering um, records of government, newspapers, letters, photos, and books. And I had two sampling methods. So the first was a systematic approach. And I applied this to government records and to newspapers. And I looked in the archives from around 1879 onwards, um, because this was the year a large cyclone had happened. But also um, the records for this period were in English, and my French is very bad. And um, my second sampling method was uh, more opportunistic and sort of pragmatic. So it collected earlier records where possible, and it applied more to things like travel logs, diaries, letters, and books. So there's sort of two approaches, a twin approach within archive work. So that was one of my main uh, methods. And if you're interested in, in the analysis of this data, I can, uh, I can come back to that in the Q&A. My second and third methods were interviews. So I did a large number, uh, 139, uh, semi-structured, sort of shorter interviews with vulnerable communities in rural areas all over the island of Mauritius. And I asked people a number of questions about the characteristics of cyclones, their memory of past events, and their perceptions of risk today. 
My third method was uh, a smaller number, 20 longer uh, expert interviews with policy stakeholders involved in meteorology and disaster management and also climate change adaptation. And these sort of meetings were, were longer. They were about vulnerability and policy and about the role of the historical record. So that was my three methods for the PhD. It's archive work, community interviews and expert interviews. Uh, that's obviously quite a lot shorter than I'd normally spend on that, but uh, I want to cover quite a lot of results. So uh, with that, the, the first thing I want to talk about is um, cyclone records and archive memory. Uh, I don't include this first because, because it's in any form of, of publishableness. I, I haven't actually started working on this paper, um, but I'm going to start with this because it makes the other data make sense and I'll refer back to it um, several times. So uh, the first thing to say is that there are multiple incomplete and in some ways conflicting chronologies out there. And for a country like Mauritius, with uh, a history of being devastated by cyclones, but also a history of meteorology, um, you might assume that the record of cyclones is agreed upon and accessible, uh, as I did. But that's not true. So even for relatively recent cyclones in the 20th century, um, there are conflicting records and there's conflicting chronologies. And the one thing is we can't assume that these chronologies are accurate. And I have an example of uh, the dangers in assuming uh, chronologies are accurate. And that's the 1882 Bombay cyclone in India. And uh, if you buy a copy of the 2008 encyclopedia of hurricanes, typhoons and cyclones, there is a section on the great Bombay cyclone of 1882. And uh, you can read about one of the great, one of the truly great Indian Ocean cyclones with 110 mile an hour winds and an 18 foot storm surge uh, that killed 100,000 people. Well, uh, luckily for everyone in Bombay, that cyclone never actually happened. Either accidentally or deliberately, the description of a cyclone was a hoax and it was repeated enough times that it made it into reputable sources and other published sources. So that's my favorite illustration of why cross-referencing and checking chronologies is so important because modern events are measured up against events in the historical record. So we need to get this stuff right, basically. And it is important to check. And I think a lot of people might be discouraged from studying this type of record or even this type of time frame because from the outside, it seems like this is a closed book, that all the interesting discoveries uh, have been made, um, but this isn't true. So in terms of uh, the chronologies that exist, one of the most important is the official uh, Mauritius Meteorological Record and their list of historical cyclones. I'm just going to show you that if I can. Uh, let me know if I lose you in this process. Um, so this is the record, this is MMS website. And as you can see, it starts from 1892 and there's no classification uh, for this event, but it was the deadliest in Mauritian history. It killed over a thousand people. Uh, we're gonna talk about it a fair bit today. But even after 1892, there's no cyclones until 1931. And uh, then after that, there's only intense cyclones until 19... Uh, 1966. So uh, the digitalized MMS record only goes back to 1945, but the instrumental data uh, in Mauritius goes back to 1851, but hasn't been digitalized. And there's another issue with this record in that around the 1970s and 1980s, increasingly, um, the designation of the severity of the cyclone and the measurements relied less and less on um, measurements taken on Mauritius Island. So basically things like uh, modeling, radar measurements, satellite measurements, ship and airborne based measurements started to become more and more important and instruments on Mauritius became less and less important. And this is the reason why of this whole record, um, Cyclone Dina in 2002 is the only very intense tropical cyclone, despite the fact that Dina had relatively low wind speeds on Mauritius Island itself. And most people in Mauritius don't identify Dina as a large cyclone or even remember Dina. Um, 
There's also a few other unexplained things in this record. Uh, for example, there's a severe depression in 2002, and there's a few other of these, despite the fact that severe depression isn't a category that's used in, in the Indian Ocean um, scale of cyclones. There's a few other things. Um, certain events are called cyclones instead of tropical cyclones. I mean, that's a very small point, um, but, the, but my overall argument is that a lot of statements are made using this record and, and clearly just this record. And there's a lot of statements that say tropical cyclone Carol in 1960, um, the same one that provided those pictures at the beginning. A lot of statements say that that's the worst and most severe and most devastating cyclone on record. And that may be true of you using this record, but obviously the 1892 cyclone was far more destructive uh, in terms of physical damages and in terms of fatalities. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. So there are a few other uh, chronologies out there. And one of the main ones is a book by BM Padia called uh, Weather and Climate of Mauritius. And that contains um, 76 cyclones from 1615 to 1983, but it doesn't detail its sources. And like the MMS record, there are some unexplained parts, basically some, some errors. It's not really a criticism of Padia or of MMS, but this is a hard thing to do. And, and uh, you've just got to check these sources, basically. And there are other partial chronologies out there, like Garnier and de Sarth. That was an inspiration uh, for this research. And they have a record of 52 cyclones from uh, 1690 to present. So as well as these chronologies, there is a lot of raw data out there. And uh, this includes early instrumental measurements. Those are the pictures in the center there. But as you can probably see, uh, these are very much decayed and uh, they sort of lie in, in, uh, in the meteorological offices waiting for someone uh, to work on them. There's also IBTRAX, which is uh, the International Best Track Archive for Climate Stewardship, which is from NOAA. And uh, the figure on the bottom shows the various time frames that these data sets speak to. So uh, the instrumental runs from 1851 onwards, IBTRAX is from around 1912, um, but actually the majority of IBTRAX's data is 1947 onwards, which is around the same time that MMS has digitalized records for. And this instrumental data is an important resource, but it only really represents or offers uh, one or two or maybe three or four um, narrow instrumental measurements of cyclones. So it offers things like wind speed, wind direction, pressure, temperature, and uh, in many cases from single locations and often taken on early instruments that require adjustment. So these measurements are not really much help in terms of understanding disasters rather than hazards. If we want to understand vulnerability, a single wind speed measurement uh, is not much use. And that's where the documentary archive data comes in, the uh, green dashed line at the bottom there because um, people have been writing about cyclones in a wide range of records in Mauritius since its early occupation. And these records offer an untapped treasure trove of information about cyclones uh, in the past. And I mean this not just as a complement to instrumental data, but uh, as an important resource in their own sense, particularly about disaster experiences. Okay, so what I did was to build a database of descriptive and documentary material about cyclones in the past in Mauritius. And what I did next was to apply a simple severity index and classification using the Beaufort scale. Um, this is a very shortened version of the Beaufort, but uh, the cartoon's really great. And the scale provides 12 classifications with corresponding descriptions of the behavior of the land, but also the built environment and the sea. And there are other scales out there, but um, Beaufort is the one MMS used, so that's the one I chose. So I took the, the collections of descriptions of each cyclones, each cyclone, and I assigned them a classification. So for example, if the descriptions had multiple references to buildings being damaged, but not destroyed, um, things like 
chimney pots being blown off or roof tiles damaged, certain trees blown down, um, high waves, ocean spray, that sort of thing, then I would designate this as a force nine. And where there wasn't enough detail to classify a cyclone, I assigned it a minus one rating as unknown. So one thing to stress about this is that this is a rating for severity of experience. It's not of instrumental characteristics. Of course, these things are connected and they're interdependent, but they're not the same thing. Uh, on top of that, there are several sources of subjectivity in this process. Firstly, it's subjective because I made a judgment and a comparison based on a collection of passages and these descriptions um, compared to this scale. Um, it's also subjective because the passages themselves are subjective. What one person considers a apocalyptic cyclone, another person might consider a routine event. And on top of that, um, the descriptions of cyclones are influenced by uh, an almost infinite range of factors at the time. Um, one example is built environment. So if we're judging passages for descriptions of damages on houses, they're going to be considerably different on colonial houses than they are from concrete construction. And that's why I stress that this is a method about comparing severity of experience in the past. It's not necessarily appropriate for uh, inferring meteorological characteristics. So that's the severity index. And at the end of all that, uh, what you left with is a chronology of cyclones in Mauritius. Basically, a list of when cyclones have happened in the past, their severity of experience, and most importantly, a database of descriptive material about each. Um, I'm not going to spend too long on this. I want to spend longer talking about the actual impact and dynamics of memory. But if you are going to talk about memory, and if you're going to talk about forgetting, um, it's very helpful to establish what actually happened. And so uh, we produced this chronology of 129 cyclones and uh, the database. And it was very interesting to see which, um, which, cert which cyclones certain sources had forgotten and which had been overlooked. So for example, um, for a period you might not expect, from the late 1800s to early 1900s, um, we found 14 cyclones of varying sizes that were missing from existing chronologies, um, some of which had uh, considerable impacts. So the chronology is uh, one of the important results. And something else you can do with a, with a data set like this is uh, investigate how memory operates in institutional records, in archives. So this is our attempt to chart the erosion of memory over time in the archive. And uh, this figure shows that when a new, a new cyclone happened, which cyclones from the past were mentioned at the time. So on the, on the X axis, you have when cyclones are mentioned, and on the Y axis, you have the cyclone event. So we excluded the data referring to the cyclone in the year it happened. And this shows when cyclones are mentioned retrospectively when a new cyclone happened. And uh, it shows that certain cyclones were repeated in, uh, in memory and in the archive records, and that these uh, cyclones were mentioned almost every time a subsequent cyclone happened, but eventually that these trail off. So it's generally the highest severity events, the red ones, the Beaufort 12s, that are uh, remembered and repeated more times and for longer. So for example, um, the 1892 cyclone, second from bottom, uh, the same one I've mentioned a few times now, that was repeated again and again over time, over the 20th century, um, before trailing off. It also shows that the smaller cyclones were mentioned in relation to maybe one or two, or maybe three at most, of the next cyclones after their impact, and then they're quickly forgotten. But obviously these cyclones cumulatively have, uh, have a significant impact. So that's um, a very quick uh, pass over the, the uh, archive and the role of memory in the archive. Um, my second set of results is about cycles in memory and cycles in responses. Um, this paper was published last year based on this um, part of the PhD. And uh, it looks at how responses over time 
to cyclones have changed, but more specifically how they haven't changed and how forgetting um, plays a role in that. And I'm going to give three examples of uh, cycles of memory, but also cycles of forgetting. So the first example is the repetitive experience of the cyclone I in Mauritius. And uh, when a large, enough cycle, a large enough cyclone passes directly over the island and conditions are just right, there can be a complete lull in, in cyclone conditions. Uh, the wind drops to nothing, the sun comes out, and uh, even birds start singing. And this can last for several hours. In fact, you can just see Mauritius peeking out from underneath um, the eye of this animation here. Um, the thing is, you can't necessarily see the eye wall, especially with the biggest systems. And when it does come back, it's the highest wind speeds that quickly return and they're blowing in the opposite direction. So previously weakened structures are often destroyed. Um, luckily, this is quite rare. In all of the archive data, I found 14 instances of direct hits of cyclones and uh, not all of these had complete calms. What um, really jumped out from the archive data, though, was that repeatedly over Mauritian history, when the eye passed over the island, a considerable number of Mauritians thought that the cyclone was over. So just to focus in on uh, the key parts of these archive quotes, what it shows is that as a result of the calm, people ventured out of their shelters, either to help loved ones, to try and start repairs, or to return home. And this had deadly consequences in many cases. This is just a small um, subset of the uh, archive data to this effect. These are from 1892 at the top and then 1945 and 1960. Basically, these experiences were just far enough apart for people to forget about the risk and the experience and to come outside thinking um, the storm was over. So that's the story from the archive data, but the community interview data suggests that this cycle is happening again today. So we asked people a number of questions about the experience of cyclones to try and get a sense of the potential uh, for an eye or their understanding of, of the potential for an eye. And the majority of the people we spoke to gave responses that either mentioned the eye or suggested awareness. But unfortunately, 16 interviewees had responses which suggest they have no awareness of cyclone eyes. And uh, this is one example. And uh, 22 others did not mention the possibility of the eye or made statements that suggest um, they might misinterpret uh, the cyclone eye. So this is a great example of the potential for archive and descriptive data to identify vulnerability and for social science interviews to connect this um, to vulnerability today and to the present. So my second example of a cycle of, um, of memory and forgetting is about perceptions of seasonality. So basically when, pe when people think cyclones happen in the year and how this has changed. In early colonial times in the archive, there was no real set cyclone season until around 1852. So this is from uh, the official Mauritius Almanac published by the government. And it describes the cyclone season as starting in December and ending in April uh, uh, on the, until the 18th. So December until 18th of April. And this changed uh, dramatically when um, that deadly cyclone of 1892 uh, came at the end of April. So April 29th, 1892. And the season, uh, the end of the season was moved to May and it still is May today. So the end of the season now ends in May. But if you examine the statements of seasonality in the archive, you start to notice that uh, phrasings and patterns common before 1892 start to happen again around 1930s. So people started to say things like, and this is from the uh, governmental almanac, that uh, the cyclone season is December to April. And the danger here is obviously that people conflate until, sorry, to April with until April. So basically, um, patterns started to emerge that suggested that people had started to return their understanding that, um, that cyclones didn't happen in April. Of course, we have, um, with our chronology, 
uh, a database that shows when cyclones actually happened. So this is the seasonal distribution of cyclones across our whole chronology sorted by severity. And you can see that January and February and March are indeed um, the most likely months, the most frequent months for cyclones, but that there's a real possibility for even the most damaging cyclones in the outer months like April. So just to compare that, this is data from our community interviews when we asked people what months large cyclones can happen. And uh, these two figures look very similar, but actually they tell a very different story because only 32 people out of 124 thought big cyclones could even happen at all in either November or April. So this is another example of uh, vulnerability being identified in the archive and then corroborated by interviews. My third example of a cycle is uh, about discourses of intervals, basically how often people thought cyclones happen and how that's changed over time. So in the early archive record, there's a lot of discussion about intervals, but there's no agreed normal return period. And this starts to change in the 20th century. And the idea that it's normal for a 15 year return period um, becomes more and more accepted. This figure here shows the, uh, the intervals between the major cyclones from 1880 until today. And you can see there's a repetitive period of uh, 15 year returns between the biggest cyclones from 1931 to 1945 and then 1960 and then 1975 and 1994. So this 15 year cycle became and still is uh, accepted knowledge in Mauritius. And uh, in the archive, we found that it influenced responses. So a lot of statements were made after a cyclone uh, that were suggesting that they had 15 years to enact changes, 15 years to recover, and that it will be 15 years until the next large one. And this is still very much believed today. So we asked our interviewees and communities how often big cyclones happen. And uh, as you can see, the largest response was 15 years, but there's also a range of other responses. And uh, another group, particularly younger people, thought that cyclones happened far more frequently, that they came every five years or less. And bearing in mind that we specifically asked how often are large cyclones, this suggests that the smaller, more frequent cyclones are being interpreted as typical of a large cyclone. On top of that, many people invoked the idea that the 15 year cycle was broken, that it had been well over 15 years since the last one, which the last large one, which many people consider to be uh, 1994. And as a result, many people said that large cyclones just aren't happening anymore and are not gonna happen again. And a third group of people um, suggested that cyclones hadn't changed, but the Mauritius had, that Mauritius had developed beyond being impacted by cyclones. Basically, there's three interconnected processes, certain people defining smaller cyclones as large cyclones, um, people suggesting the cycle is broken and people suggesting that Mauritius has developed beyond being impacted. And uh, these three really feed into the one of, one of the biggest trends of the interview data. And that's that a considerable number of people in Mauritius seem to think that cyclones are either no longer a threat, no longer, occur, no longer occur at all, or have become significantly weaker. And one of the consequences of this is that certain members of the community may ignore uh, warnings, which we'll come back to uh, if we have time. But those are three examples of cycles over time. The cyclone I, the perception of seasonal timing and the perception of frequency. Okay, so um, now the third part of the results is about institutional trajectories of vulnerability. And this takes a deep dive into the history of one cyclone and its long-term consequences. Uh, I'm in the process of trying to publish this data set. Uh, I just got the review back. It was slightly bruising, but uh, I think it, it's really going to definitely improve the paper. So the paper itself is about um, institutional responses to cyclones and how these change over time, but specifically how decisions uh, influence vulnerability over the long term. And the paper particularly talks about the development of an early warning system in Mauritius 
and uh, we have to go back to 1880 to uh, to tell this story. At this point, a series of uh, flags were used to warn sailors of the approach of bad weather and uh, to instruct ships to lower their masts. And this was operated by the harbour master and it was only really to, um, to ships. There was no warning to the general population. Um, so this figure is from 1851. 1851 is also the year that um, Charles Meldrum established a meteorological society in Mauritius. He went on to found the meteorological station as its director and he served as director for 22 years. He is one of, he is one of the key figures of uh, cyclonology. And there's a great paper about this from uh, Martin Mahoney. So Meldrum um, started issuing cyclone warnings to Mauritian newspapers from 1871, when the observatory, which is in the center of the island, was connected to the capital, Port Louis, on the west coast via an overground telegram cable. So this is an early example of its use from January 1872 and uh, Meldrum detailed his early warning system in a publication in Nature. So from at least 1872 a codified system was used in which a telegram from a central observatory was sent uh, and included warnings to newspapers for the general public with recommendations of actions to take. Um, we think this is the first single station early warning system in the world, cyclone early warning system in the world. Um, it's been overlooked for this title until now. Uh, before this, the Cuban early warning system was thought to be the first, but the earliest Cuban warning was in 1876. So Meldrum was the first, and he was held quite rightly in, in very high regard in Mauritius and he was considered a very uh, skilled forecaster and he was also very confident about his skills um, suggesting that no gale of any magnitude could um, slip past him. The early warning system was used a few times um, and it warned Mauritians of the approach of a cyclone in 1879 and he again, Meldrum again, published a list of uh, warnings but as the cyclone got close to the island um, the telegraph lines were blown down and the communication was lost as the highlighted area shows and the archive documents show that this was because trees had been allowed to grow close to the telegraph lines and that they then fell onto the uh, lines and in fact the same thing happened in February 1892 when uh, a cyclone wind that didn't exceed 50 miles an hour brought the telegraph lines down again and we couldn't find anywhere any mention of this as a particular issue or something requiring remedy, which is worth bearing in mind. Because uh, on the 29th of April, 1892, that deadliest cyclone that I mentioned before smashed into Mauritius. It utterly devastated the island. Uh, it killed well over a thousand people and almost no structures survived. Um, the wind speeds were estimated to be an incredible 240 kilometers an hour. And a major element of the cyclone and the way it was experienced and the way it was remembered was based around the narrative that it was a freak, that it was so late in the cyclone season. And uh, as I covered before, at this point, the cyclone season only extended to March. And so everyone um, thought that the cyclone season was over. As a result of this, a major theme that comes up and up again when um, you examine the archive data was that it was literally unpredictable. The cyclone could not have been predicted. And perhaps most importantly, um, that there were no warning signs. And these are just a few of the quotes to that effect. The thing is, um, Charles Meldrum did not even arrive at the observatory until 11 a.m. on the day of the cyclone. For the two days prior, he was down at the ship's docks in the capital. And the archive data shows that the second assistant arrived at 6 a.m. and prepared this telegram at 9.55. And then the first assistant arrived at 10.15 and prepared this telegraph at 10.25. Um, but unfortunately, these telegrams were never sent, or excuse me, they never arrived uh, on their destination. And then finally, after arriving at 11, 
Meldrum sent this at 11.20, um, shortly after he arrived, obviously. And by the time he'd reviewed the instrumental measurements from the days and the hours leading up to this, by the time he realized what was happening, uh, it was too late. And uh, the telegraph poles were blown down. It was unable to send any more communications. And the eye crossed the island at 1.30 with far higher wind speeds than 56 miles an hour. So this wasn't a storm without warning signs, but it's also an entirely understandable failure. This is not to fault Meldrum or the meteorologists at the time. It's very easy with hindsight to say that this was, um, that this was somehow, uh, you know, a, a, it, was, it was a mistake, but it's very easy with hindsight to talk about it. But we have to recognize that they were working with the understandings of the time and with the records of the time which even today, as I've covered, uh, is not easy and is complex. But what's important though, and what I think this, the story this data tells, is about the impact of those discourses of the cyclone having no warning signs. And this discourse had uh, real consequences. This is perhaps one of the biggest consequences um, because several months after the cyclone, there was a long and contentious debate about whether the telegraph line should be buried between the observatory and between the capital and the main train station, the police offices and uh, other places. And the debate was won by those whose two central arguments were that the cyclone could not have been predicted and that no improvement in warning could have been achieved despite the total failure. Basically that the cyclone was unpredictable. So just to focus on a couple of sentences in the closing parts of this debate, that Meldrum's telegrams would have been useless during the last cyclones. Um, and if we still have them, them being cyclones in the future, which I do not believe, the population will not need dispatches from a meteorological scientist to keep himself on his guard. Uh, Creoles and Indians, when they see a lullica, will know what it means and will take every precaution. And very sadly, this is proved untrue almost immediately. And by 1931, um, people have forgotten about the cyclone eye. In a hundred years, the tradition will repeat to new generations, also not true. People will always remember April 29th um, and that it will be a waste of 7,000 rupees. 7,000 rupees isn't a small amount, but it's also worth considering that it costs 1,500 rupees every time the telegraph poles are blown down and had to be fixed. And a large amount of money um, was found to quickly restore the sugar plantations and to try and return profitability to the colony. Um, so that's just part of the story, but the story doesn't end there. So they didn't bury the telegraph lines and this trigger this triggered uh, a long line of cascading impacts. In three of the subsequent cyclones, in 1897, in 1902 and in 1908, uh, the telegraph lines were again blown down at critical points. When these cyclones were curved, as they're prone to do in the Indian Ocean, the upgraded warning informing people um, that the cyclone would be a direct hit could not be sent and, uh, and there was great damage and people were killed. Obviously, it's very hard to directly attribute um, things like deaths of cyclones to things like that, but we can say that um, these warnings were interrupted. And over time, the early warning system evolved and it changed, but the same vulnerability was never addressed. So the research includes detailing 15 other cyclones from 1908 to present where communication and electric lines were damaged and repeatedly the idea of burying the lines was suggested and uh, repeatedly it was rejected. And each time this happened, the repetitive nature and the accumulative impacts uh, were not recognized. And the next cyclone was always thought to just be the next guy's problem. Uh, in 15 years or so. And this isn't just a Mauritius thing, this is fairly universal. Um, and today in Mauritius, the vast majority of wires are above ground, overhead power is still 94%. I'm not suggesting that there's some ma uh, malicious conspiracy here, just that these decisions and their impacts are not often understood or investigated, and they need to be placed in their historical frame. And if we do that, the institutional trajectories of vulnerability can be uncovered. 
So I've got about three minutes left. I'm going to attempt to try and tie this all together. Um, in the first part, I tried to show that uh, the record of and the chronology of cyclones is not a closed book, that by using documentary archives, we can get an essential perspective on disasters and it can provide important insights into things like demonstrating the erosion of memory. Uh, in the second part, um, I showed that by examining history, uh, specifically of experiences, we find that certain patterns in responses have repeated over time. And I called these cycles, but actually I think I'd rather call them helices, because much like the critique of the flawed disaster cycle, the word cycle uh, implies a return to an original state, which uh, is not quite true, because it is both deja vu and jamais vu. And these patterns, these helices, are essential to understanding vulnerability today. Uh, in the third part, I tried to show that a historical approach also reveals the institutional decisions that have shaped vulnerability over the long term. And it's memory and forgetting that these lessons have in common, whether it's loss of memory of the cycle and I, or past events or institutional decisions, it is memory and forgetting that sits behind this. I have one last thing to show you, uh, and this is the memory of past cyclones in communities today. Uh, this shows which cyclones were mentioned and how often. So you can see that the memory of the 1892 cyclone is almost completely gone. Um, but this also shows that memory is not proportionate to severity as an instrumental metric. What I mean is that people don't remember cyclones according to their meteorological characteristics. It's experience that determines memory. And that's the reason why Gervais in 1975 is far better remembered and talked about than Claudette in 79, because they had essentially the same wind speed and similar impacts. But Gervais happened 15 years after the last big one, which neatly fit into the pattern, but also it was more traumatic as a result. Similarly, Cyclone Alonda in 94 um, was partly remembered because of an incident with a werewolf, uh, which I'm hoping someone will ask me about in Q&A. And 1945 was a year of three cyclones, um, none of which were especially big, but the year became famous and the single events were collapsed into one aggregate event in memory. So m almost everyone that recalled those thought this was just one event. And this was before names were introduced in 1960. So several people I spoke to thought the cyclone was called number 45 and didn't realize that it uh, referred to the year. All this is to say that the processes of memory certainly aren't proportionate to wind speed. And it comes back to the original idea of needing to understand disasters uh, and not just hazards. This also speaks to some of the original 1980s arguments uh, that there's no such thing as a natural disaster because hazards can have uh, identical metrics but disaster outcomes uh, vary massively according to a, a wide range of factors. And I'm suggesting that one of the essential factors is, is memory. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there with just two quick comics and I think they are the, the key lessons uh, from this research. The first is that without better understanding of history, uh, we can't fully understand vulnerability and resilience. We need to account for those uh, long-term, slowly changing processes, one of which is memory. Um, and that memory and forgetting isn't a uh, straightforward transmission of facts into memory or their erosion over time, but it's a complex process at many scales. It's influenced by power dynamics and by culture. Um, and not only does memory determine the impact of cyclones, but decisions made in the distant past themselves based on memory influence the way cyclones are being experienced today. And for the second cartoon, uh, that history often sits in its own bubble and disasters in the past are viewed as one-off curiosities, uh, unconnected to the present. In fact, traditional history tends to divide events, but we need to bring these things together. And uh, it's actually only through combining history with other datascapes that uh, we can get to the bottom of historical and contemporary disasters. Just to say uh, thanks very much for listening and uh, please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. 
Thanks, Roy. Um, really interesting um, presentation. And if if anyone has questions, feel free to um, pop them in the in the in the Q and A tool. And there's there's a couple there from Rich already, but I think I have to just start with uh, with your reference there towards the end about the, about the werewolf. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued. Do you, can I be cheeky and share my slides again? I have I have a few slides on the werewolf. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So. This is a part of the talk I, uh, I didn't have time to give, but basically I have a, a, a fourth paper or a third paper in preparation about um, cultural responses to cyclones over time. Um, and very quickly to give background to that. In 1994, um, Cyclone Alonda struck Mauritius, as I mentioned, and there was damage to the electricity network, unsurprisingly, because everything was overground. But anyway, there was a um, there was a blackout in some places for months, and uh, in the dark of the blackout, something really strange started happening. People started claiming that a shape shifting werewolf or a lugaru was um, breaking into people's homes, terrorizing people uh, before disappearing into the night. And uh, in its human form, the werewolf was described as a naked man, in many cases um, covered in coconut oil. And uh, it started in the centre of Ireland, but it quickly included all of Mauritius. And uh, this is a quote from my interviews in the top and, and a book about the uh, mass hysteria at the bottom. And it really eventually overtook a, a considerable part of the island and um, the president was forced to respond. And uh, there was a meeting of religious leaders um, to, uh, you know, to try and calm people down because as the second quote shows, there was um, some some real issues with this. Um, my point I'm, I would make with I'm trying to make with the paper with uh, an academic I'm working on it with called Robert Rafael is that this is portrayed as something that's laughable or embarrassing, and it's not. It uh, it is part of a long history of cultural responses in Mauritius, and that's something I didn't really get time to cover. Um, that the archive research we did showed that there's a lot of cultural responses to Mauritius, whether it's things like um, this example was a, a belief that uh, a woman in black predicted the cyclone in 1892, or um, from the interviews that people used the behavior of plants and animals to predict cyclones. So um, what I'm saying with this is that all cyclones are cultural and all responses to cyclones are cultural and they're mediated by culture. And the cool thing about the knowledge about how to predict cyclones was that we also found that in the archive from 1888. So for well over 130 years, people have been saying um, these same things, telling these same stories, teaching people how to predict cyclones using um, think cues from the environment, basically. And uh, this really challenges, I think, some of the assumptions we have about um, the role of local knowledge and culture on islands like Mauritius, which don't have any uh, indigenous um, population. So yeah, that is the werewolf um, case study. Um, I'm working on that at the moment, but yeah, that's I think one of the most interesting angles of it is, is that people don't respond necessarily in the way you'd assume that there are these interesting cultural responses and we have to account for that. Thanks. That, that actually brings me on to, to, to one of the questions I was going to ask you, which is obviously Mauritius is a really interesting place to be to be doing this sort of research. But how did you end up doing research on, on Mauritius? How, how did how did that become your, your, your field site? Yeah, it's it's quite a boring story, actually. It's somewhat more um, logistical. I mean, I think it's somewhat career based and somewhat logistical. So I, I previously worked in the Pacific before my PhD, and I actually wanted to return to the Pacific, but we only get a very limited stipend, as you know, um, as a PhD student. And, and there was also a consideration about whether I should diversify a little bit and become an island, a small island specialist, rather than just a Pacific island specialist. So uh, I looked at various other options. Um, George Adamson, uh, my supervisor, um, he really helped with the historical approach. So we talked about where records were, records in English, not too decayed, obviously somewhere I could afford to go, um, which Mauritius has direct flights. So that's really great. 
but also um, where we knew some people because um, I had some help with a uh, research research assistants and uh, basically Ilan knew a few people in Mauritius that could help me out with the logistics of the research. So it's not it's not as exciting as I hope the story is. It's a mixture of practical career and logistical uh, considerations. Okay, we have a couple of questions for, from Rich. The, the first one he said is, can, can you share more about how you identified, um, accessed, captured and reviewed newspaper archives? Yeah, totally. Yeah, very happy to do that. So um, accessing, um, there were two main locations, three at a push, really two for the vast majority of the records. And that was the National Archives in uh, close to the capital in Port Louis and the National Library, which also had backlogs of uh, newspapers. So for the newspapers, I did the um, structured approach that I discussed. So it was more systematic and it was somewhat iterative. So I had my list of years that cyclones happened and the severity ranking. And I basically aimed to build up, I think it was six months. So it was two month, a month before the cyclone and five months after, I'll have to check, but something like that for each newspaper for the dates that we knew major cyclones happened. And then when I discovered new cyclones, I searched for them in the newspapers. So it was kind of a, 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 circ a cyclical approach. When it came to the analysis, I used uh, Envivo. So basically I, I uh, put it all into a database in Envivo. And the great thing about that was that on a single click, you could correlate every reference to a single cyclone if you coded it right. So, and that's where the data from the uh, figure with the um, erosion of archive memory came from because we had this amazing data set with all these passages about cyclones and uh, you could bring them together and see which date they came from. That was more or less it on newspaper I think. Did that, did that answer your question? Happy to add more. Thanks Rory. Yeah I mean it, I, I suppose I asked the question out of our own interest in newspaper work in, in India and it was just just interested to how you approached it because I'm, I'm aware that they're deeply consumptive exercises so it was interesting oh, yeah. to that, so thank you. Yeah just on a, on a personal note as you say about being it being a bit of an intense exercise if anyone is thinking of doing archive work I would recommend it but it's also very quite draining and, and I found it quite um, not upsetting. I found it quite stressful at first because I spent a long time looking and didn't find anything for the, for the longest amount of time. And it caused quite a lot of stress. Um, and like I said, I, was, I wasn't a historian before this. So I spent roughly 50% of my time in Mauritius in the archives. So it wasn't a, um, a jolly or a holiday on the beach. I spent quite a lot of time tearing my hair out in these dark archives. Um, but we got there in the end. Yeah, I think persistence was, was the key. <laughs> Yeah, you've, you've, you've touched on a couple of questions I, I was going to ask you. I, I was going to ask you a bit about your, your experience of, use, of using all of these methods in, in part because I'm conscious that we've got one or two of our, our second year undergraduates um, on, on the call who are, who are thinking about their, their, their dissertation research proposals. And I was, I was also curious about how you, how, you, how you managed all of the data, but it sounds like you made really good use of, of in vivo for that. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I have... Are we, are we particularly tight on time? And do you, are there many other questions? I just, because I have a video I can show you of me doing the coding in Envivo that your students might find helpful. How are we doing for time? We've, we're good on time. Okay, cool. Would you mind if I share that? Just because I think that might be quite helpful. Please do, Rory. Okay, one moment. Here we go. Uh -huh. Okay. Can you see that? We can, yes. Great. Okay. Oh boy. Now I can't see it. <laughs> I may have bitten off more than I could chew here. Uh, see, I gave, I, I tested in vivo in a talk, uh, and it worked perfectly. And I don't think it worked perfectly if I try and boot it up. But let's see if I can get this to work. Okay. Uh, One moment. So just bear with me. Here we go. Let's see if I can show that. Okay. Can you now see the Envivo window? 
can. Uh, okay, great. So this is in vivo, and uh, it, it, it can act as a way to sort your data, uh, but it can also, it's mostly used as a coding tool. So here on the left, uh, I have my three data types. So I have uh, so Rory, static on the screen. Sorry? It's static on my screen. I don't know about other people. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll abandon it. No problem. I can I can explain it in person. Um, right. So uh, basically, the way I brought together the data types, and this was a real revelation to me, was through Envivo. So they, I had different um, codes and nodes for each of the three data types. So interviews, expert interviews, and archive research. And I created a set of interrelated nodes, which is what Envivo rather annoyingly calls codes. And uh, I use these to sort of bring together the different data types. So to give one example, um, in Envivo, I had a collection of all the mentions of the Cyclone I from the archive, but I also had a collection of all the statements about the Cyclone I from experts and uh, from community members. So yeah, Jim, just to, just to speak to what you said about bringing together the data, that was a real challenge. Uh, and I think there's a lot of potential pitfalls with that, and it's very tricky to do. But I think if you use something like in vivo, there is sort of a structured way to go about it, and uh, and you might not get overwhelmed, <laughs> which is definitely a risk, because these data types often don't lend themselves to, to being integrated. And it's one of the challenges of interdisciplinary research, actually, is, is to sort of um, try something like this but I think a systematic approach, potentially using a piece of software like Envivo, uh, might be the way to go. I can send the link to anyone that's interested um, of that video if you want to see how that was actually done. Uh, I'll just put that in the chat. But yeah, does that does that answer your question? It, it does, yeah. Thanks, um, because uh, I, I I I was curious because. Obviously, I've, I've tried to combine diff different methods myself, and, and sometimes yeah. in projects that haven't involved nearly as many interviews as yours did, um, and still I ended up with, with a huge amount of, of, of data and, and yeah. basically trying to do the same thing, trying to use in vivo to, to, to manage. Um, we had another question from Rich about whether you've um, shared any of these findings with local stakeholders with the goal of evolving um, policy and practice and, and improving DRR outcomes and uh, if so what were the stakeholder responses and aspirations? Yeah absolutely that's a great question and it's a really important one as well I think one that's often overlooked and I think we have a tendency not well, not we but um, we have an obligation to certainly return our findings to the people we work with and actually a large part of that is maybe about from the start of the project changing the relationship between a researcher and a subject and instead approaching it as collaborators which is something we're trying to do i tried to do in this and we're trying to do in my current research um specifically uh, so i collaborated with the red cross in mauritius and, and they were a massive help that was part of one of the ways i did um the community interviews with the guidance of the red cross so they suggested which communities would be good to talk to so that was one of the sampling methods and I sent the thesis and the publication, and hopefully there'll be other publications, to um, various partners in Mauritius. I had hoped to go back and, and run a workshop and I put a funding bid in for that. I didn't get the funding and it also wouldn't be possible now, but uh, I think something like that is, is on my radar. Um, if anyone has any spare money, <laughs> feel, free to, feel free to send me back to Mauritius. Um, I am very interested in, in, in putting together non-scientific outputs. I haven't yet had a chance to do that, but I've done stuff like that before. Um, I'm particularly interested in things like cartoons of, of uh, research outputs, and I know there's some great examples out there of that. Um, unfortunately, the, the postdoc, well, not unfortunately, very luckily, the postdoc came straight after the PhD. And if there's other people on the call who are early career researchers, uh, it is hard to find time to do all the things that you want to do, let alone all the money. And so I, I hope that I'll be able to do more communication of stuff like this because peer review publications um, definitely aren't enough. Um, and I think 
I'm pretty sure the, the one I do have isn't even open access. But of course, I send it to everyone uh, who wants it and even the people who don't. But um, yeah, that's definitely something I've got my eye on. Um, yeah, sorry, that was a rather waffly answer. Um, people responded to it quite well, I think. Um, the paper about institutional responses, uh, I think that might be different. I think uh, that, that has the potential to ruffle some feathers. Um, I think I, I got mostly good reactions from the work on cycles of responses. Um, but again, you know, I think obviously most people in Mauritius will never have heard of it. So, and that's something I'd like to change, but yeah, it's tricky. Thanks. Um, a question from, from Deborah. She says, apologies, I couldn't listen to all. Did you use diaries and personal records in the research? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Diaries and personal records were essential. They were part of the second um, sampling method. So the, the more pragmatic, opportunistic sampling method, uh, mostly guided by archivists, because as I said, I, I don't have a historical background. So um, I needed quite a lot of help finding those sources. Um, but they were actually some of the most interesting, rich and, and detailed. Um, those of you that have done archive work on government records will know that they have this strange detachment and very clinical way of writing about stuff that can be quite depressing, actually, because they're writing about people dying and, and uh, very serious concerns, and they're writing it in very bureaucratic language, whereas travel logs, particularly travel logs like uh, Mark Twain's travel log from Mauritius, is one of the most amazing um sources you didn't spend long there but um yeah it's really a fantastic detailed travel log in mauritius it's also open access available online uh if anyone's interested but um yeah a number of different letters photos diaries and books the correspondence um was particularly helpful held in the national archive uh, a lot of this was colonial but there were some some personal materials as well Thanks. Two um, questions from, from Vishwa. He says, how, um, how have you dealt with the possibility of bias in information recorded in archival records? Information is often underreported or exaggerated. Yeah. And then he says, memories are often deceptive and short-lived. What sort of cautions do you think should be taken when working with such methodologies? That is an absolutely brilliant question. Yeah, fantastic. Um, well, so in the Colonial Archive, for example, the the voices that were represented were overwhelmingly white male colonialists. And this obviously very much determined what they said about cyclones. Um, often they were posted to Mauritius as part of a colonial posting. They were there for a limited amount of time. They had no experience of, of cyclones or really of, of the context at all. And uh, some of the impacts they're writing about were oblivious to the impacts on other people. So that's, um, one of the biggest challenges that I struggled with. And it's also one of the reasons that I emphasize that, that the severity index is about experiences. And I think, I guess the critical question is whose experiences are these? Because uh, as much as I tried to um, diversify the voices that were represented in my historical collection, inevitably there are certain voices that are overrepresented and others that are underrepresented. Um, I think if anyone's doing this kind of work in an indigenous context, this might be really interesting to see if there could be a third data type um, to bring in, including indigenous knowledge, just to sort of compare those and compare those experiences. I think there's a lot of caveats, uh, as you said, to examining that knowledge and to examining memory. I guess how I dealt with that was I sort of approached every... Um, every archive piece with a critical appraisal of its uh, origin, the authorship, uh, its propinquity, if it was faith, if it had faithful transmission. Um, and a lot, a lot of pieces, for example, for the figure that showed when cyclones were mentioned retrospectively, a lot of pieces were rejected for that because they were not close to the source. They were not uh, directly written after the cyclone. And yeah, it was a real challenge. Um, Again, that's not, that's not a concise answer, but actually it's a very tricky topic. And I think your question is absolutely spot on though. It's really 
quite a challenge. Um, yeah, if anyone else has any other perspectives on that, just bearing in mind that I'm not a historian. So yeah, thank you for your question. That looks like it's all the questions we've we've got. Unless uh, I'll, I'll leave a final opportunity if anybody wants to wants to jump in with any other questions before we uh, before we wrap up. Maybe while people are thinking about that, if I might just cheekily plug uh, a research seminar series at Cambridge that I'm one of the conveners for of disaster research. Where is the chat? So it's called the Cambridge Disaster Research Network, um, rather misleadingly because it's for everyone. It's not just for people from Cambridge. Um, and we have uh, two seminars a month during term time. The next one is about um, cascading and interconnected hazards. And um, the one on the 1st of June is about space disasters. And we have speakers from NASA, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, the session I'm chairing. So if anyone is interested, uh, do please follow the link and, and join up. Uh, yeah, anyway, and, and thanks again to everyone for, for coming and for your questions. Thanks for that, Rory. It's uh, always always good to hear about other opportunities to, um, to to participate in these sorts of events. And it looks like nobody else has uh, has um, has offered any more questions. There's there's very really positive comments appearing in the in the chat, and, and I would just add to those by, by thanking you again for for joining us today and for uh, for for such an interesting presentation and uh, such interesting answers to the questions. Um, so thanks again for that and i'm going to hand over to to rich to, to wrap things up and to uh, to say a word or two about our next event so thanks again rory and uh, over to you rich thank you jim and also very much uh, our thanks uh, to rory for that a really interesting presentation today uh, it shows a real depth of endeavor and work and some clear beneficial outcomes for society so thank you rory um, so now moving on to uh, just a brief note of our next event, which I've just posted in the uh, chat. Um, and that is um, by Dr. Vishwa Chandel from Punjab University in Chandigarh in India. And Vishwa is going to talk to us about the Kulu district in Himal Pradesh and really look at it from multiple perspectives, but try to pull together um, issues related to the development of the region, which is ongoing, but also look at its disaster impacts. So building on many of the themes we've heard here today and indeed in prior events. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. That concludes our session this afternoon. Uh, so we'll draw it to a close now. So thank you very much, folks.